So let's begin by uh, reading the section in chapter 18 on forgiveness. Uh, we'll read from chapter 18, verse 21 through the end of the chapter. Okay. <clears throat> Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often shall, shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began the reckoning, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees imploring him, Lord have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But that same servant, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison till he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant, as I had mercy on you? And in anger his Lord delivered him to the jailers till he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Mm. So what, um, what relationship does this seem to have to the previous section? on who's greatest in the kingdom, on, on who is uh, on, on uh, reconciling differences. Um, what, what is the apparent relationship? It, it has to do with mercy having mercy for others just as god has had mercy or forgiveness for us if your brother sins against you you know talk to him directly um it's all about you know trying to reconcile and not continuing to punish mm -hmm. right there's also an element of uh, in in this section the uh, the, the reconciliation section dealt less with, um, by implication, dealt less with sort of a personality, uh, uh, personal animosity or personal conflict. Um, but that sort of situation often feeds over into personal animosity, especially, ironically, you know, when you're successful at. <laughs> And getting somebody to repent and say, "Yeah, I was wrong." <laughs> it's like that. That becomes inadequate, <laughs> and and you know you want to get them because. Uh, and also, uh, the the uh, uh, Peter here asks the question about sinning against me. So, uh -huh. so the context here is a little bit different. Uh, that that it's it is one in which one perceives oneself to be sinned against, or or you know the victim of 
somebody else's sin, although it's both closely related to the previous section, mm -hmm. but it's also a little bit different. Um, just as a sort of... I'm the previous sorry. section seemed to be more about things going on in the church or between the in the community, and this one's more person to person. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, just for the sake of whatever refreshing our memories, let's review the earlier emphasis on forgiveness, uh, all from the Sermon on the Mount. It uh, starts with chapter 5, verse 21. And then we can move on to Peter. Twenty one, did you say, Ron? Uh huh. Chapter five, verse twenty one. This is the beginning of the, you have heard it was said, but I say. You have heard that it was said to the men of old, you shall not kill, and whoever kills shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother shall be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool shall be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Make friends quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you will be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out till you have paid the last penny. Then also in the, then skip to uh, verse 38. On retaliation. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist one who is evil. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your coat, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to him who begs from you and do not refuse him who, you, who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And yet if you salute only your brethren, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And then let's jump to chapter six, verse 12. So here we have the, the uh, end of the Lord's prayer or near the end of the Lord's prayer. And then Jesus reinforces the, uh, the part of forgiving trespasses at, uh, after the conclusion of the Lord's prayer with an additional paragraph. So verse 12 is, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And then at the end of the prayer, Jesus adds, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father also will forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, 
neither will your father forgive your transgressions. So forgiveness is a major theme. And Peter offers to forgive seven times. <clears throat> where does he, do you have any idea where he gets the number seven from? Isn't it considered the perfect number or perfection? Uh -huh, it's divine per perfection, right? Yeah, that's one. That's one meaning. Is there another? Well, there is another. Does anyone know what it might be? Let's take a look at Genesis. Is it is it fourteen? What? No. Is it the seven days? Is is what fourteen? The other number. No, no, it's seven. But what what is the other the other significance? Seven oh, days to create oh, the oh. world. I'm sorry. What, Mary? Seven days to create the world. Yeah. And all that's in it. Yeah, that's divine completion. Now let's look at Genesis chapter four, verse fifteen. Four fifteen. Actually, let's start at verse eight. So this is Cain's murder of his brother Abel. Mm. Cain said to Abel, his brother, let us go out to the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me this day away from the ground. From your face, I shall be hidden and I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And whoever finds me will slay me. Then the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone slays Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him seven whole, sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest anyone who came upon him should kill him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So, Vengeance will be taken upon the murderer of Cain sevenfold. So uh, St. Hilary of, of Poitiers pointed out that, that uh, what Peter is trying to do here is to reverse the curse of Cain or the curse placed upon Cain, the, uh, the sevenfold vengeance for killing Cain. So in, in the rabbinic tradition also, or, uh, also, <clears throat> also emphasized forgiveness, but in rabbinic debate, three times was considered sufficient. So Peter almost certainly, <clears throat> in reversing the, uh, the uh, sevenfold vengeance for killing Cain, and turning it into forgiveness is almost certainly imagining himself as being over the top. As so being gonna, what? Mary? As being what? Over the, top, over the top. Okay. I mean, we can imagine that, that, uh, that Peter is feeling very proud of himself. And then and then Jesus burst the bubble.
So it begins uh, with the authoritative, uh, I tell you in a slightly different form. I, I, I do not say to you seven times, but so it's nevertheless a, uh, a divine pronouncement. Uh, and it's a shocking one. And Jesus says uh, not seven times, but 70 times seven. So there, there's ambiguity in, in the Greek word. So it can be translated as either 77 or 70 times seven. So in any case, 70 is seven multiplied by 10. And seven is of course the number of divine perfection. And uh, 77 70 times, right, 70 times seven. Okay, 70 times seven is seven times seven, which is the divine perfection twice multiplied by 10, which produces a very large number reflecting divine perfection. And 77 is seven, plus seven times 10, again, two sevens representing divine perfection and 10 magnifying the quantity. So so the implication is that we should carry little notebooks with us and you know, when we become angry with someone, you should, scratch out, you know, put a little X for the number of times we've forgiven them so that we can bear in mind that after either uh, 70 times 7 or 77 times, we have to, we don't have to forgive them anymore. <laughs> Yeah, so actually, so the point then is that that uh, the, the actual number is unimportant, yeah, is unimportant and, and that there's there's not it, the uh, there's no place to keep an account. And so Peter's question and answer is sort of misconceived because one can count up to seven. And if one is counting, then one is not forgi uh, forgiving. And forgiveness isn't to be conceived of in, in quantitative terms. So where does Jesus come up with either the 70 times seven or 77 fold? Does anyone know? Well, going back to the other one, you have to be perfect like your God is perfect. And what he's saying is that no matter how much, it, how many things happen, you have to keep forgiving mm -hmm. to be uh -huh. perfect. And this is a big number of perfection. Mm -hmm. It's also another reversal from Genesis. Let's take a look at uh, Genesis chapter four, um, verse 24. Verse 24? Yeah. Actually, let's start at 17 so that we don't sort of jump in the middle. The, 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 um, the 70 times seven or the 77 is a reversal of uh, Lamech's cry for vengeance. So, which one's the chap? Which chapter is? Uh, for Gen Genesis chapter four. Did I say Genesis? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Good. So Genesis chapter four, verse 17. Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Erod and Erod was the father of Mehujael and Mehujael the father of Methushael and Methushael the father of Lamech. So it's Lamech that we're interested in. And Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other Zila. Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have cattle. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. Zila bore Tubalcane. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubalcane was Naaman. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zila, hear my voice. Your wives of Lamech, hearken to what I say. I have slain a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech, seventy-sevenfold. Wow. But by implication, Lamech is... Um, First of all, implying that unlike Cain, he's righteous and he's slain somebody in self-defense, whereas Cain merely murdered his brother because he was jealous that God preferred Abel's sacrifice to Cain's. And so therefore, it's not adequate that he should kill simply the person who, who uh, Slit, who, who injured him, he also wants additional vengeance 77 <laughs> times or uh, 77 fold. So that's the, uh, the, uh, the vengeance of Lamech. And so Jesus is reversing that very much like Peter tried to reverse the the punishment for uh, for killing Cain. So, in some sense, the, the forgiveness is the antitype of the vengeance and the threat of vengeance in Genesis chapter four. So, questions about that? Ron, it's not a question about this, but is anybody else hearing your voice as an echo? I hear, I hear ticking going on. Yeah, I hear, I hear, I'm hearing too, and that's why I muted my, my, my microphone. I'm gonna mute I thought it was me, like kind of. I'm gonna mute too, just to make sure, because it's, it's kind of hard to hear Okay, yeah. Yeah, actually, there does seem to be a good bit of static. Um, I don't hear it anymore. Is it better with everyone muted? Yeah, actually, I don't hear it anymore either. Can anyone, everyone hear me clearly? Yes. Okay. Um, so, oh, so are there any thoughts or comments or questions? Now that we're all muted? <laughs> I thought that this number was just like a big number, you know, that it we are not going to be able to count. Uh -huh. it, it is a big number and you shouldn't be able to count, but it's also a reversal of Lamex cry for vengeance. So it is really a type and an anti-type that is a uh, a reversal of the original type. So the cry for vengeance should it should be replaced by an equivalent cry for 
uh, a request for forgiveness. So the parable of the unforgiving servant is unique in Matthew. And, uh, and note that it's Jesus describes it as a kingdom of heaven parable. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king. So, but interpretations of the parable, other than from the early fathers, are really all over the place. And they really center, center on, on, let's begin with, instead of uh, the interpretations of the parable, the monetary sums. The first servant, um, so it, everyone sort of gets that the money is sort of a synonym or a symbol of a debt for sin. The first servant owes 10,000 talents. So one talent is 6,000 denarii. Uh, a denarius is basically one day's wage of a day laborer. Uh, peasants and peasants make a good deal less than that since their you know, economy consists of uh, some combination of, of, well, since they're subsistence farmers, so their economy consists of whatever is raised for market to provide the cash they need, and the bulk of which is you know, raised, produced for subsistence and, and the, the support of their, their families. So for a, a day labor, a denarii is a denarius is a day's labor. So ten thousand talents is uh, sixty million denarii. So it's about one hundred sixty-four and a third years worth of wages for a day laborer. So to, to give you some sense of the, besides that, to give you some sense of what the amount means, the, the, remember that we discussed the temple tax at the end of chapter 17 and the, the sort of obligation of every Jew, both in the Holy Land and in, and in the diaspora to pay the tax. That tax raised only 600 talents a year according to Josephus. Herod the Great's income, so the Herod when Jesus was young uh, and when the, uh, the Holy Family fled to Egypt, his income was estimated at 900 talents a year. And the taxes for Galilee and Perea the, uh, on the other side of Jordan were 200 talents a year. <coughs> so this is you know, basically billions and billions or a gazillion dollars. This is really almost an unimaginable amount of money. In contrast, the the, uh, the second servant only owes 100 denarii. So that's the equivalent roughly for a day laborer of about 100 days wages. So it's still very significant. It's for, and for most peasants, or at least you know, peasants uh, you know, with a subsistence economy, it probably is more money than they'll see in a lifetime. So it's still a substantial amount of money, but it's a conceivable amount of money as opposed to, you know, billions and billions of dollars or 
10,000 talents. So we have a huge disparity between those two amounts. The, the first servant owes an inconceivable amount. The second servant owes a large amount, but not an inconceivable amount. Yet the first one was the, the first one was forgiven. The, the servant who was forgiven, yeah, owes an inconceivable amount. So interpretations of the parable other than from the fathers have really been all over the place, including within the, the, the Catholic tradition. Uh, so the major questions are, what does this have to do with Jesus saying 70 times seven or 77 or whichever number it was? And the second question is, is the king a symbol for God? So let's start with the second one. Is the king a symbol for God? What are the, uh, what are the pros and cons? I thought I thought the king was God because our death, the death of our life compared to the death of the others, you know, against us, it's inconceivable. It's like way bigger. It's like uncalculated. You cannot calculate that. So that's why I thought like it's more based on the price and like they're forgiven and, and God forgive us for that. Uh -huh. You know. But then in the second part. God also applies some sort of punishment no, on uh -huh. us for not forgiving the other one. Right. Um, but the, uh, the, the king forgives the ungrateful servant <laughs> the first time, but as soon as he, uh, he bungles it, he gets uh, thrown in prison and required to repay the debt. Since he, uh, Chrysostom points out that uh, that since he uh, couldn't pay the debt in full um, in the uh, in the first place, he's not going to be able to repay it in prison. So effectively, he's been put in prison for the rest of his life, he's going to uh, to die in prison. So that, that sort of illustrates one-time forgiveness, it would appear. Which I hope is not God's plan <laughs> because we keep failing. <laughs> I keep failing. So you know, I need more than one chance, for sure. Uh huh. So the the second one reminds me of going to hell. You know, it's for a life, it's for the rest of your eternity. Uh-huh. Um, but it was it was because not because he did the same thing, you know, he made a mistake again. It was because he out he couldn't forgive somebody else. Uh-huh. Plus, he forgot the forgiveness that he did receive and insisted um, when he really shouldn't have, he had no right to. The, the second servant. 
Yes. Yeah. So in terms of uh, the argument for the king being a symbol for God, um, Jesus makes that explicit in, in uh, and, and then, I mean, among commentators, we have, you know, sort of the usual argument about what is the original part spoken by Jesus and what has Matthew added and and so the general feeling is that the parable the body of the parable itself is um from jesus but the introduction the, the therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to uh is from matthew and the conclusion is from matthew i don't you know see that there's there's a, a basis for deciding what are Matthew's editorial editions and that depart from Jesus' original sayings. So I don't know that that we, um, that that makes a, a great deal of sense. And then it also kind of uh, analyzing it in that way begins to raise the issue of why everything is here, why Matthew presents it here in the first place and what it has to do with anything. And so that seems to be you know, sort of problematic. Um, but in, so in any case, the, the uh, evident point of the parable is precisely that, that the king is a symbol for God. The, um, the ungrateful servant, if we, we, um, if we um, accept the notion that the king is God, then the ungrateful servant, uh, very much like you said, Carmen, becomes a, sort of, he becomes really a stand-in for you know, sort of a universal and very sinful humanity. And he becomes sort of an everyone writ large. He gets, in fact, I mean, you know, he becomes a hypocrite. He, he, uh, he gets forgiven, but he's not willing to extend forgiveness. The, um, the difference, there's also a great deal of discussion about the difference in amounts with, with some people, some contemporary interpreters feeling that Matthew has inflated the what used to be, um, I don't remember how many talents, like a thousand talents to 10,000 talents or something. He's magnified the amount for effect. Um, but Chrysostom points out that the difference in amounts represents the, the difference between a sin against God and a sin against man. And then Chrysostom makes the point that that's even further magnified by the fact that we don't sin against a person when he or she is watching, but we sin against God very brazenly, even though he's watching because we don't really believe it. And so underlying Chrysostom's argument is sort of a major theological principle. So the, these, these two quantities, the the um, the um, the disparity in the amount of of talents, the ten thousand talents and the hundred denarii, 
um, reflect you know, sort of the, the, the quantities reflect a qualitative difference. So quantity here becomes quality. And so the first servant owes the king and is unable to repay an enormous amount. How do we get to an enormous amount? The sort of a basic theological principle that the magnitude of a sin or of a debt or of a wrong is determined by the dignity of the person against whom the wrong is committed. So God is infinite. God is, well, infinite. We can stop with that. So therefore, an offense against God is an infinite offense. The capacity to repay a debt, to redress a sin, to atone for a sin, is based on the dignity of the person who commits the sin. So the unfaithful servant is a person, he's a human being. Human beings are finite. So on the one hand, the sin or the debt of the first servant is infinite, his capacity to repay it is finite. It can never, ever be repaid. It can only be repaid if it's forgiven by an infinite God, which is what happens in the parable. And so then the problem arises with the fact that the uh, first servant who has been forgiven an infinite debt insists on collecting a finite debt from someone who owes him, who has sinned against him, who, who uh, owes him a debt. So on the one hand, we have, so we basically have this, this hubris or this hypocrisy that um, my infinite sin against God must be forgiven or will be forgiven but my neighbor's sin, finite sin against me is unforgivable. But one's neighbor is finite just in the same way you are. So on the one hand, you have an infinite debt that's forgiven, but you can't forgive a finite one. You've sinned against God, which is fundamentally unforgivable, and yet you can't forgive someone who sinned against you just as you've likely sinned against him or others. So that's the theological principle underlying the parable.
So another way in which the king is like God is that the king forgives the debt of the first servant out of mercy and out of a sense of compassion and not out of a sense of justice. It's very clear from the parable that the justice was uh, the king's first uh, encounter with the the uh, with the first servant before he forgave him debt. He was going to be ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So he was going to sell him into slavery. Is that what is shocking about this, um, this parable? Because I'm waiting for the shocking part. I know we're going to have a shocking part. You know, the one that is like, oh, but this is inconceivable for that time. You know, like that's absurd. Well, the, the, um, the, I mean, the shocking part is that I think the shocking parts are, first of all, that this enormous debt is forgiven. That, I mean, you know, it, it's kind of hard to, hard to imagine that, especially given that, you know, the amount, uh, the 10,000 talents, is you know an inconceivable amount i mean it's sort of like you know somebody forgiving the u.s national debt if someone could so that's shocking the um i think the behavior of those Servant, first servant is supposed to be shocking, is shocking. In the uh, very same words that he says to the king in begging for forgiveness are the very same words said by the second servant, repeated by the second servant to him. And yet he throws him into to prison. It's possible at least that he might be able to pay the debts since it is a finite amount, but nevertheless, that's the shocking part. And I think for us, the, the, the conclusion is also shocking, although I'm not sure that Jesus intended it to be. The, we, what, what, what I think gives the parable, it's, um, what I think gives the parable its, um, what is the word? Justice? No, no. Uh, what I think makes people tend to see the parable is about something else and that the king is not an image of God is the fact that it includes judgment. And judgment is something you know, that we often try to, to avoid or we try to, you know, find workarounds for. You know, so the, um, although it's not a, a Catholic doctrine, you know, the, the doctrine of justification by faith alone is, you know, really in, one can see it as an attempt to avoid judgment, right? I mean, it's all, the judgment has already been performed when you've led Jesus into your heart. So there's, you know, no need. It's it, judgment merely becomes a, a, a formal 
recognition of something that's already happened. So, you know, in, in, in many ways, it, it reflects, I guess, an element of our either, first of all, our disbelief that God is going to judge us in the first place, uh, a, a sense of, uh, you know, does he really have the right to do this? And also an underlying uncertainty about, you know, what the outcome might be. I thought he was using it as kind of a shock therapy. You better be listening because this could happen to you if you don't pay attention here. Yeah. Yes, it could. It very much could. So, um, so jumping back a bit to the arguments for this, the king not being God, one of the arguments is that this is, the, the king is really, so starting with the, um, who is the greatest in the kingdom? Jesus is really presenting a sort of countercultural model of, you know, sort of, I guess you could say a countercultural model of power and authority that those who have authority are servants. And to the extent that we all have authority, which we all do, we have authority only as servants. That's the base. And as people who have sacrificed ourselves, that's sort of the model of where uh, who's greatest, which is to say nobody's really greatest. But in the parable, the, the, the sort of model is really based on particularly while well, everyone argues Roman imperial power, right? so the king is you know, sort of arbitrary despot. So he decides one minute that he's going to collect the debt, decides the next minute that he's going to forgive it, and then reinstates it with even worse punishment. So that's sort of arbitrary, but the uh, but the problem with it, I mean, in terms of at least in, the problem with an attempt to cast it as you know, sort of a purely Roman model of um, of authority is that any king in you know in the period before constitutional monarchies is a despot. The king does what he wants. Herod the Great really fundamentally did whatever he wanted. Uh, the, uh, his sons were demoted, so they have more limited power, but still they do uh, enough of what they want to, you know, be arbitrary, despotic, and, uh, and thought to be insane. And uh, you know, the, the Hasmonean leaders in the, the second part of the Hasmonean dynasty for its last half century of existence before uh, Herod came along were also equally despotic. So this is sort of really a, a model of, of what kings are, except that um, in this case, the king doesn't appear to be working for his own self-aggrandizement and, and God does not work for self-aggrandizement. God, as the fathers constantly pointed out, doesn't need anything and doesn't actually require anything of us because he doesn't need anything from us. God is self-sufficient. God is I am. 
be self-defining and, uh, and is not defined by his creatures or by his creation. So, um, so there's, there's also a way in which Jesus is tailoring this parable to the culture in which he lives, I think to reinforce the point. So Middle Eastern culture, Mediterranean culture is based strongly on a sort of a strict hierarchies and honor and, and shame. And what the, what the uh, I think what everyone would probably understand. So the king has a right to collect this debt, right? It's owed to him. He has decided to be merciful and to forgive the debt out of compassion. And so that sets, that defines a model of what an honorable thing to do is that the king has extended mercy to you and therefore you should do the same. That's kind of the honor part of an honor shame culture. And so what has the first servant done? He, having had his debt forgiven and therefore that's set as a model for him, He's decided that he's going to collect the debt from the second servant. So what kind of statement does that make? He's greater than, than the, than the uh, other servant? No, not great. It has nothing to do with the other servant. Well, that he's taking advantage of him. He is taking advantage of him, but that that isn't really related to honor and shame. Well, or everybody it, else felt or it sorry. Or peripherally for the is, but the question is, how does it relate to the king? Or what statement does it make about the king? The king is generous. Well, no, he's not saying that the king is generous. He's saying that the king is what? He's saying the king's a fool. He's saying the king's a fool. Oh, I see what the you're king saying. Is a okay. Fool. Right. Okay, I, I can the see. The king that. is a fool. He's an idiot. He's incompetent. He doesn't know how to manage his affairs. But I do. And so we can look at this, in fact, in the same way toward you know toward God if when we fail to forgive that god has forgiven us and yet we're not going to forgive because obviously god is a fool god doesn't really know what he's doing but i do know what i'm doing that's a completely different perspective of what you think people would think <laughs> yeah, I think I, I I think it's a completely different perspective because we don't like to we don't like to think about judgment a great deal, and we don't like to think about the consequences of our actions in relationship to God. You know, it's kind of like Chris Austin pointed out we. We uh, don't sin against our neighbor when they're watching, but we sin against God very brazenly. In some form, we, we, you know, we think we'll slip one by him or he's not really watching or he isn't who he says he is or, per, or you know, perhaps we think, well, I mean, the very, you know, the, the, uh, I've talked a lot about that book, The American Religion, that you know, it's basic contention in, in, in the American, uh, uh, that, that the American versions of, of Protestantism, 
all of the, the versions of Protestantism that are unique to the United States and were, were born in America, but they all are based on uh, transforming God so that he's made in man's image. They all view God as he's made in the image of man. And so that, that's kind of a, 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 a tendency to, that we see ourselves as superior and the greater and God as the lesser. Obviously that approach itself is sinful. But <clears throat> and then the uh, wanting to not wanting to face judgment, you know, I think is really a a major thing. It's something that we're all uncomfortable with. And, uh, and want to, uh, you know, sort of minimize or dismiss or solve, you know, if we can. But God is just and merciful. So there's, if, if we focus on God, then there's nothing that we need to be afraid of. Our sins will be forgiven. God is merciful. God's desire is that all be saved. So it's always important to, to keep that in mind. So questions or thoughts or comments about It is a very powerful argument. It's one that we don't believe enough in God. That's why we sing, because we wouldn't do anything against our brother if they're watching. But we do against God. Uh -huh. That's very powerful. Like question like how much we believe. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's really good. That's from <clears throat> that's from Chrysostom who who had just you know very very many profound insights. Chrysostom is just always well worth reading and contemplating. And how little our faith is, how significant our faith is. Mm -hmm. To be honest, right. Right. Any other comments? So is that all clear? There is a lot of food for thought in this section. Yeah. About how we live our lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So and how we Mary, treat others. I'm sorry, go ahead, Mary. I said, and how we treat others. Right, right. So for the parable, clearly, I think the king is a symbol for God. I think there's no question about that. And all of the sort of whatever is is uh, misguided and and misplaced. I, I think it uh, it stems from a not wanting to look at judgment and 
And in many ways, I think we should embrace judgment. It's a necessary step to hopefully receiving our reward. But let's go back to at the, the question, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? How, how would you answer that? Or how can I be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? What, if I aspire to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, what do I need to do? You need to serve. You need to you serve, need to... right. Mm -hmm. And you need to stop being worried about being the first one in the kingdom of heaven. Uh-huh, yeah. I think... And then do the stuff. <laughs> Really, realize and do what you need to do. Yeah, a really critical thing is that you need to not aspire to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You you need to fundamentally, you really need to not care. And you need to focus on God. Not care or be humble. Be humble, but but if you're caring about being the greatest, I mean, you know, there's a way in which we can we 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 serve as a work to please God, or we are going to take on humility because we want to please God. But those become things you do that are you know sort of covers. For the fact that you expect some sort of ulterior reward, right? But the reward, the reward is really not heaven. The reward is God, and God is here with us now. God is omnipresent. So you focus on God, not worry about the you know, don't have any aspirations. I don't want to be the greatest. I, you know, don't, I want to be a servant of God. And God will take care of the rest because God is faithful and God is good and God is merciful. God will forgive my many shortcomings, my many sins. So the, this is a really powerful chapter that you know, reverses in, in a lot of ways, everything we think about, you know, how do you become great? You aspire to stuff and you, you know, kind of be a go-getter and, and, uh, and uh, you know, you drive yourself to do whatever. And, you know, you can drive yourself to be humble and you can drive yourself to be a servant. But if you're doing it because you want something, you're not really doing it. It's not really who you are. Remember from St. Gregory, the single beatitude is God. It's always God. You are, have, we have become sons and daughters of God through our faith in Christ. That's the reward. All of the other stuff is, in some ways, you know, icing on the cake. So any final thoughts or comments?
Everybody's digesting. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot to digest right there. <laughs> well, do we, uh, next week, do we need to start by seeing if there are any further thoughts about it? Would that be helpful? I think we all need, I, I think you, I think we've got the point as far as we just have to keep forgiving <laughs> uh -huh. because we, we've been, a, we've been forgiven unconditionally. Uh -huh. So right. we need to, we need to either keep count or <laughs> no. <laughs> No, we, we, we just have to just keep forgiving. It's hard. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's hard. Yes, it is hard. I'm with you, Thais. Uh, you know, how can we count? <laughs> There's lots of things that we could use forgiveness for. It also gets us in trouble if we don't, because if you're bringing up old issues, in your relationships with other people because you haven't forgiven and it just creates like a, a, a wheel, you know, a gerbil wheel. Yeah. Right. And you're constantly in angst and constantly um, irritated. It's yeah. just not worth it. Uh-huh. Well, there, there's, there's also, yeah, I mean, if it doesn't, you know, poison your relationship with somebody or lead to, you know, a, uh, an escalation of a bad relationship that gets worse and worse. Then there's also, you know, the, the sort of scenario where the person who you're angry and refuse to forgive has no idea that, you know, you, you were hurt. Yeah. And, you know, you're, you're fuming. Sometimes they don't care either. <laughs> yeah. You well, know? Frequently, you know, a, a lot of times people have no idea that, that they've done something wrong. You know, it was not intended or, um, you know, it was an unforeseen consequence or something, or sometimes, you know, we're even wrong. You know, the person who hurt us didn't really, didn't mean to and shouldn't have hurt us except that we misinterpreted or we misunderstood or we overreacted we behave badly and we're still angry at them. So, so the thing is that, you know, the other person is blissfully ignorant. They're going about living their lives and, you know, you're possessed with anger and this desire to get back. And it, it, it's very frequently the root cause of, of many psychosomatic diseases. You know, psychosomatic not <clears throat> meaning and physical in, in your mind physical diseases that yeah. that have you know are are emotional in their their origin and often very serious diseases and it, it's been argued that that cancer can be you know, a psychosomatic disease okay so next week we'll we'll uh, We'll start with chapter 19, and we're really moving along. <laughs>